پیغمبر رو میفرمایند ان الحسین مصباح هدن نه هدا از اشتباه میکنم خودش هدن ان الحسین مصباح هدن و سفینت و نجات خب اینجا وقت نگذاشتن نگفتن فقط شست یک هجری تا میگیم آخر حکومت عباسیان نه 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 مصباح و هدن و سفینت و نجات تا روز قیامت چراغ است چراغ هدایت برای زندگی که ما داره نام میکنم مالا تو زندگی اگر شما ببینید چه زندگی داره میکنه از بشر چقدر گمراهی هست چقدر مشکل هست خب کسی باید یک چراغ روشن کنه براش تا راهش رو بدونه شما الان داره از خونت میان تا این مسجد اگر همه خیابان ها خاموش باشه چراغاش ماشینت هم چراغ نداشته باشه جلوی چشم تو میتونی ببینید میتونی راه تو بیاید تا اینجا به سلامتی برسید به مسجد مصباح و هدن هدایت شما این زندگی تی هدایتی میخواد کسی که هدایت بکنه و سفینت و نجات یعنی کشتی نجات چرا بختن چه سفینت و نجات شبها اقیانوس یعنی دریا خیلی خیلی تاریکه اگر شما ببینید این کشتی داره یک کیلومتر دو کیلومتر اون طرفتر داره میاد چراغش روشنه میتونی معیر بکنم یا هیچ کشی داره میاد گفتن سفینت و نجات یک تاریکی خیلی تاریکه دو دریاس شنا بلندیسی چی میشه؟ غرق میشه میره پایین و پایین و پایین دریا گناه گناه آدم میکنه یک گناه دو گناه سه گناه این بدن پر میشه دیگه از گناه پر نه که میشه پر و پر و پر و پر از گناه پر میشه قلب سیاه میشه قلب سیاه میشه نماز دور که حتی حاضر نیست بکنه سفینت و نجات امام حسین میاد تو راه محرم میاد میگه بیا 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 طرف همون سالی که رفت شما نخوندی نماز حج نرفتی زیارت نکردی هیچ کار نکردی الان محرمه به اتیاب راه دیگه میده شما هر کسی ممکنه بگه میشه آره حرم ابن یزید و یاهی روانو با تمام یکی از سربازان معروف کوفه که برابر بود با هزار سرباز سرباز از لحاظ قدرت سرش آورده پایین علامه‌شو آورده پایین نگاهی 
به آقا نمی کنه به چشم آقا نگاه نمی کنه ترسیده که آقا بهش میگه بلگرد چه خبر آمدی؟ اما آقا بهش چی میگه؟ سوال میکنه از حضرت میگه میتونم توبه بکنم راهی هست آقا بهش چی میفرمایند؟ این توبت تا با الله نه اینکه میگه حال می بچه ها رو ببین زنگ هم رو ببین خیمه ها رو ببین اگر می داشتی من راهی رو می رفتن این طرف کوفه اینجوری خبر نمی شد که اگر من محاصرم با سی هزار سرباز که حضرت صادق می فرماید مثل یک انگوشتر که می رد تو دست این تو انگوشت چطور محاصره کرده این انگوشتر انگوشتو حضرت صادق می فرماید محاصره کرده بودن سی هزار سرباز در حدیث من دیدم هفتاد هزار سرباز خود یاران با عبدالله حسین اگه همه شون حساب بکنی همه شون حساب بکنی من خودم خیلی جستجو کرده بیدم تا کجا میرسه عددشون ست تا بیشتر میشه این هم وقتی که ست تا رو حساب میکنن با سفیر اول که آقا فرستادم به کجا؟ سفیر اول کیست؟ احسنان سفیر اول سلیمان ابن رزین سلیمان ابن رزین سلیمان ابن رزین سفیر اول حضرت آقا عبدالله حسین بود آقا فرستاده بودن بیشان را به بصره رسید بصره نامی از آقا در دست داشت که آقا به پنج قبائل پنج قبائل بصره خواسته بود آقا ازشون که خودشون رو برسونن کربلا با آقا کمک بکنن سلیمان ابن رزین اینا گرفتن ازش نامه را بردن پیش کی؟ آبید الله ابن زیاد آبید الله ابن زیاد قبلی که بره کوفه استاندار بصره بود همین که نامه آقا آبا عبدالله حسین را دید پاره کرد و سلیمان سلیمان ابن رزین را به شهادت بخان همه اینا همه اینا از سلیمان ابن رزین تا آخرین سرباز آقا ابا عبدالله حسین که در کربلا بعد از شهادت آقا کشته شد هف هف میگن صد تا صد تا هفتاد هزار هفتاد هزار آقا بگی بگیم اینا به حرق که ببین بچه ها و این خانم ها و این خواهر و زینب و کلشون و این زن ها و این بچه نوزاد و چه خواهر و چه کار کردی با من گفت نه این توبت تا و الله و توبه کن خدا توبه تا قبول کن حدیثی که اینجا آمده این زیارت اربعین آقا می فرماین جانش را در راه تو بدل کرد کی؟ امام حسین تا بندگانت را از جهانت و سرگردانی گمراهی برهاند در حالی که بر علیه او به کمک هم برخواستند یعنی همون دشمنا کسانی که دنیا مغرورشان کرد الان این مثل ما رو مروزه اما الان میشه این مثل رو شما بگیم کسایی که دنیا مغرورشون کرد آره متاسف متاسفانه آره خیلی هستن در این روز در این روز دار دنیا مغرورشون کرده 24 ساعت کار میکنه 24 ساعت دنبال رفاه این دنیا هست حد اقل این ماه مبارک محرم ماه شهادت آقا ابا عمدالله حسین این کار رو تو بذار یه طرف یا کم تر برو وقت تو بیشتر بذار در خدمت آقا ابا عمدالله حسین آخه انسان چقدر میخواد کوشش بکنه چقدر میخواد کار بکنه تا جایی که خودش میدونه کافیه دیگه براش اما نمیدونم من چه خبره بعضی ها هرچی بیشتر بهش بگی بیشتر میخواد حضرت علیه فرمودن گفتن دنیا همین دنیا که ما توی زندگی می کنیم وقتی کسی این لذت دنیا رو می کشه لذت دنیا رو می کشه برای بعضی ها کافی نیست کافی نیست بیشتر می خواهد تو بیشتر می خواهد تو بیشتر می خواهد یا 
که لقمه میشه دو لقمه دو لقمه میشه صد لقمه صد لقمه میشه هزار لقمه هزار لقمه میشه یه میلیون لقمه بیشتر و بیشتر و بیشتر حضرت میفرمایند حضرت علی این کسی نیست براش کافی بذاره دنیا رو غیر قبل وقتی که خاک رو سرش میگیزن میگه آقا این کافیه تمام شده خب اینجا میفرمایند در حالی که بر علیه او به کمک هم برخواستن لش کنه یا نه عمر بسن بعضیاشون آمدن خود عمر بسن عمر بسن آمد چیکار کنه به جنگ با آقا تا بهش رای رو بیدن رای یعنی تهران تهران اون وقت یعنی همه ایران خب این برای رای اومده تا پادشاه ایران بشه بعضیاشون اومده بودن برای یک سبد یک سبد خرما گفتن برو بکش پس این رو به یه سبد خرما بعضیاشون اومده بودن برای یکم یک قطعه پارچه تا حمله بکنن به خیمه ها یا با عبدالله رو حسین یک قطعه پارچه بگیرم این چی مردم دیگر متاسب کنم الان کسی هستن الان اینجور دیگر روحتی رو میفروشه، اهل بیت رو میفروشه، دین رو میفروشه همین بیرون دارم برایش هم هیچ اشکال نداره میگه فقط تو این دنیا ما آسایش باشه یه رفاهی برامون باشه کسانی که دنیا مقرورشان کرد و بهره واقعی خود را به فرومای تر و پس تر چیز فروختن یعنی دنیا رو برای آخرت فروخت آخرت خو اول العابدین هستی اونجا میگه نه من این دنیا رو میخوام این دنیا رو میخوام دنیا رو میفروشه میره به طرف چی؟ برای لذت دنیا آخرت چی؟ خواهی این حدیث میفرماید میفرماید به آخرتشان را به کمترین بها به کمترین بها این الان نمیگیم سبد خرما اون حتی اون پادشاه ری خود حضرت زید الشهدا در کربلا قبل از روز عاشورا به عمر ابن سر از فرمودن حتی ری رو بهت نمیدن اما اصرار کرد اصرار کرد اصرار کرد اصرار بر گناه چه گناهی؟ کشته کشتن ابا عبدالله حسین و اهل بیتش به این حد برای چند روز و یک دو سه روز حکومت و آخرتشان را به کمترین بها به گردونه فروش گذاشتن تکبر کردن و خود را در دامن هوای نفس انداخت تو را یعنی خدا و پیامبرت را به خشم آوردند این در زیارت اربعین حضرت ابا عبدالله الان ما اولین شبی از این شبها رو میخوایم سفری بکنیم و گفتم دو ماه این دهی محرمی که ما داریم دهی محرم آغازشه اوجش آجوراست اوجش اربعینه کسی باید از خودش سوال بکنه خودش من چی میخوام از امام حسین از امام حسین این شبهای که میخوام بیام مجلس با حسین از حضرت با عبدالله حسین چی میخوام؟ این سال خیلی مهمیه میخوام توی این مجالس فقط بیام تا با این سیاهی مردم سیاه بیشتر بشم حشم و معناسی عید مثل اون آقایی که نشسته بود نماز میخوند نماز مغرب تموم شد چرا کردن تقریبات خوندن یکی صدا زد گفت خونه فلانی آتش خورده آتش زده مردم بلند شدن این نفهمی چه خبره مردم بلند شدن شروع کردن دمیدن رفتن اون طرف خونه سوال کردن از این مومن که به کجا داری میدنیم کجا داری میدنیم گفت نمیدونم گفت چرا شما داری میدنیم گفت دیدم دارم میدونم دارم میدونم دون باچه بعضی هم اینجوری هم ما وقتی که میام مجلس با حسین همین فقط میخوایم بیایم حتی این آمدن هم خیلی مهمه حتی آمدن تو این مجالس مهمه اما کسی با این دوت عمق داشته باشه یعنی بیشتر بخواد آخه این مجالس مجالس حضرت با عبدالله رو بسید 
اما شما دیدیم تو فاتحه وقتی که ما داریم تو این مسجد وقتی که ختم قرآن داریم فاتحه داریم جلوی در کی وای میشه که به همه با سلام بکنه کی اقوام میت دیگه جلوی در وای میشه هر کسی میاد داخل سلام کنه جزاك الله خیر جزاك الله خیر الله اجرك انت على الله هو فارس میگیم لما اخرتون بشه ان شاء الله فلانی که از دنیا رفته با حضرت محمد و آل محمد مخشوب بیگردانه خب جلوی در اقوام میت بار میسرم این مجلس کی واسه تو جلوی در کی صاحب این مجالس صاحب این مجالس حضرت زهرا سلام الله صاحب این مجالس پیغمبره صاحب این مجالس حضرت علی صاحب این مجالس خود حضرت ما حسن مشتباز برای همین یکی از مؤمنی دعوتش کرده بودن در کربلا از سخنان معروف کربلا به نام شخ عبد زهره کعبی روز آشورا شما هر جای دنیا اگه برید هر شبکه دنیا میگه نگاه بکنی مقتل شیخ عبد زهرای کعبی گذاشتن یه خانومی اومد پیر زنی از آغاز از این شیخ طلب کرد که دهی محرم آمده برای ما یه مجلس میتونی بخونی اصرار کرد گفت خانم من مجلسم تو حرم ما خسایی این قبل از پنجاه سال این داستان تو حرم ما خسایی هزاران هزار مردم میان گفت اصرار کرد گفت مجلس من من مجلس دیگه اون مجلس ما خسایی نگرم مجلس ما خسایی گفت انشاء الله تموم کردم از حرم بیام طلب خانت شب اقدر تموم شد مجلسش گفت آدرس کجاست آدرس رو دیگاه کرد دید آه اصلا بیرون از کربلا چون رو رفت چون رو کار راه رفتن به طرف خونه این خانم تو کوچه ها و اون طرف و این طرف دید این خانم بایسته جلوی در یه خونه خیلی کوچیک فقیر گفت آمدی من آمدم دیگه بعده دادم المؤمن ایدا و عده وفا بفرمایید اومد داخل برایش یه آب و برد این کسی نیست تو خونه برایش همی سندری گذاشته آبش تموم کرد گفت بفرما شکرم گفت کسی نیست کسی نامده حضوری نیست گفت شما چی کار بده مجلس ما آقاسه این بفرما برو بادم چی برو بخواه این شما هر چی بخواه رفت نشست بارای سندری شروع کرد بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم مجلس اول تموم شد شب دوم شب سفم چارم پنجم ششم هفتم هشتم نهم کسی نمیاد خونه خالی فقط خودشو میگی بزن روز آشورا که آشوراست روز آشورا اصلا کربلا قیامته کربلا قیامته این تموم کرد مقترشو در حرم حضرت ابا عبدالله حسین رفت طرف خونه این خانه خب من بهش وعده دادم باید برم قول دادم باید برم رفت طرف خونه این خانه نشست برم آب بیارم آب و برد یکم آب خورد گفت شروع بکنم بله بفرم گفت خانم روزم کسی نیست کسی نامده گفت شیخ من این همسایه هایی که دارم هر سال دعوت شروع میکنم مجلس من بیان هر سال بهشون میرم اما قبول نمی کنم یعنی خونت خونه کچیکیه فقیر هستی کار باید نداره گفت امروز هم کسی نمیاد قبلی نیست فقط من و شما بعد بالای منبر شروع کرد خاندن مقتر را مقتر چیه؟ همون شهادت حضرت و عبد الله حسین را مقتر شروع کرد رسید به جای رضا اخبا عبد الله حسین با حضرت زینب خدا حفظی حضرت زینب و اخبا عبد الله یه مجیه شنید سرسدای شنید تو خونه خودش میگه احساس کردن یه زمین لرزه ای شد یه صدای شنیدم صدا میزد و اخاه و حسین و اخاه و حسین او برادر جان و حسین 
نگاه کردم تو خونه این خانم پیرزن دیدم خبری نیست کسی تو خونه نیست خب ادامه دادم الان مثل من نبود که هنوز مصیبت رو نخوندم شروع کردم گریه کردم قوت قلب داشت ادامه داد میگه ادامه دادم حضرت ابا عبدالله رو حسین رفتن به طرف قتلگاه و شروع شد جنگ و بزن و بگیر و آه تا جای رسیدم که حرمله حرمله نامجیب تیر زدن به قلب ابا عبدالله حسین صدای شریدم وا ولد وا ابتاه وا حسینا پدر جان حسین جان نگاه کردم دم خبر نیست دو این خانم هر دفعه که این صدا را میشترم این زمین لرزهی احساس میکنم تو این خونه شده این خبری هست تا جای رسیدم که ابا عبدالله حسین افتادن بر قتلگه و شیم نرسیم یا آبا بچستن همین جا رسیدم دیگه نتونستم ادامه بدم شنیدم کسی صدا زد وا و ندا وا حسینا نگاه کردم تو خونه این خانم می پیر زدیدم خبری نیست صدا زدم خانم کسی تو خونه هست گفتم اتاق دیگری داری گفت نه همین خونه کسی نیست تو خونه اما هر سال روز آشورا این صداها رو میشنم صدا زدم میدانید اینها که هستن گفتم نه گفتم آن که صدا زد و آخا و حسینا آن زینب است و آن که صدا زد و آبتا و حسینا آن رقیه است و آن که صدا زد و
السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله تاجاني كرسيدا سدا زدا فإنه ذبح كما يذبح الكاش ترى قري كنا بر حسين سدا زدا شن حسين رام مثل بوس بندي سر مريدا ترى أبوفت البوسمان از حضرت زین العابدین سوال می کنیم آقا زین العابدین در بازارهای مدینه راه می رفتن قصابی را دیدن صدا دادن ای قصاب به این گوسفند آب می دهید قمی که او را بکشید او را دبه بکنید گفتن بله ما به وسایات شما به وسیلی های شما عمل می کنیم یک به او آب می دهید دو او را پیش بقیه گوسفندان سر نمی بریم نمی بریم آقا همین که این را شدیدن حضرت زین را آبدین به طرف کربلا نگاه کردن سدا زدن السلام علیک یا عبتا حتی گوسفند را آمیدند و حتی گوسفند را جلوی پسر و بچه هاش نمی کشند اما به تو آب ندادند اما تو را جلوی پسر و بچه ها و دختر ها و خواهر ها سر مریدند اگر کشتند اگر کشتند چرا آمد ندادند مگر
مختصر نزاداری کنیم و سینزنی میتونن که ترکیه ها رو پس کنن یا میتونن هم در جای پس کنن سینه رو کنن در این جای پس کنن میتونن سینه رو کنن نه رو کنن محب دستیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم Yeah. 
اکبرم به خون غلطان اکبرم به خون غلطان اصغرم فدا گردد لاله حسن پر پر در رای خدا گردد خط لگای سقای با وفای ما اینجا چشم من اینجا تیر و نیزه و خنجر تیر و نیزه و خنجر پاره پاره می گردد پاره پاره می گردد پیکری علی اکبر آتشم به جان زند خنده علی اصغر آتشم زند بر دل خنده علی اصغر قتل گای یارانه با وفای ما اینجا با وفای ما اینجا چشم خواهرم گیرید چشم خواهرم گیرید دور قتل گا دشمن دور قتل گا دشمن بهر دخترم گیرید با ملائکه جد و باب و مادرم گیرید چشم انبیا گیرید چشم انبیا گیریان در عزای ما اینجاست کربلای ما اینجاست نینوای ما اینجاست کربلای ما اینجاست نینوای ما اینجاست کشته می شود اونو جفرم در این سهرا کشته می شود اونو جفرم در این سهرا غرق خون شود خاکه کربلا در این سهرا سنگی کی نمی بارد بر سرم در این سهرا لاله گنز خون روی حق نمای ما اینجاست حق نمای ما اینجاست کربلای ما اینجاست نی نمای ما اینجاست کربلای ما اینجاست نی نمای ما اینجاست دشمن آتش افروزد دشمن آتش افروزد خیمه های ما سوزد خیمه های ما سوزد دامنی یتیمانم دامنی یتیمانم از رعی جفا سوزد قلب شیعیان بر ما تا 
صفی جدا سوزد تا صفی جدا سوزد گوش خلقی آلم خور از صدای ما اینجاست از صدای ما اینجاست کربلا ما اینجاست نی نوای ما اینجاست کربلا ما اینجاست نی نوای ما اینجاست کربلا ما اینجاست نی نوای ما باز این چه شورش است باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است باز این چه نوح و چه عزا و چه ماتم است باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است باز این چه نوح و چه عزا و چه ماتم است باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است باز این چه شورش است گرخانمش قیامت دنیا بعید نیست گرخانمش قیامت دنیا بعید نیست این رستخیز آم که نامش محرم است در بارگاه قدس که جای ملال نیست سرهای قدسیان همه بر زانوی غم است باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است باز این چه نوح و چه عزا و چه ماتم است باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است جن و ملک بر آدمیان نوح می کنم جن و ملک بر آدمیان نوح می کنم گویا عزای اشرف اولاد آدم است گویا عزای اشرف اولاد آدم است خرشید آسمان و زمین نور مشرق قین پرورده کنار رسول خدا حسین باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است باز این چه شورش است که در خلق عالم است این دل تنگ مقده ها دارد این دل تنگ مقده ها دارد گوی یا میل کربلا دارد این دل تنگ مقده ها دارد این دل تنگ مقده ها دارد این دل تنگ مقده ها دارد این دل مجور مانده در غربت میل دیداره آشنا دارد میل دیداره آشنا دارد این دل تنگ مقده ها دارد این دل چشنگ مقده ها دارد این دل تنگ مقده ها دارد هر شب جمعه اندران گلشن هر شب جمعه اندران گلشن حضرت زهران آلها دارد حضرت زهران آلها دارد این دل تنگ مقده ها دارد این دل تنگ مقده ها دارد این دل آمیل کربلا دارد این دل تنگ گویا 
یدای مادر ای گل پر بر کو علم دارد کو علی اکبر قاسمت چون شد کو علی از غر مادرت ما تمزین عزا دارد این دل تنگم مخده ها دارد این دل تنگم مخده ها دارد گاهی آمیل کربلا کربلا قربان گای عاشق است کربلا قربان گای عاشق است هر وجب خاکش قصه ها دارد حسن جان حسن جان حسن جان حسن جان یا عباس یا عباس یا عباس یا عباس در وقت آوری ها مجلس میشه چون مجلس ادامه داره و هم از وقت سرفجوی شد و انشاءالله که از همه شما خوبان التماس دعا داریم از بزرگان مجلس که در این مجلس اعضا اشتراک کردن هم ثواب اعضاداری از این مکان مقدس بردن و هم باعث تشویق و حضورشان باعث دلگرمی و تشویق و ترغیب جوانان و نوجوانان میشه از حوصله مندی یک و یک شما قدردانی میکنیم خداوند ان شاء الله که بر همه ما به حق خون بنا حق ریخته یا با عبد الله الحسین توفیق ادای مسئولیت و اعمال همه ما را حسینی قرار بدهد و به حق خون بنا حق ریخته یا با عبد الله الحسین یک جان سر و امنیت برادری و قوت صفا و صمیمیت در بین تمام ممالک جهان مثل و مخصوصا وطن عزیز و ستمدیده ما برقرار بگرداند و همچنان به آبروی امام حسین خداوند انشاءالله که تعجیل در فرج آقای ما صاحب ما مولای ما که با آمدنش انشاءالله دردها و رنجها و مشکلات رفع و دفع خواهد شد و دردها به دوا خواهد رسید قرار بدهد برای آقوبت بخیری خودتان خانواده هایتان و نسل همه ما بر محمد و اهل بیت محمد صلوات Karbala, as I step onto your sand, you capture my eyes. Karbala, I see heaven has been laid beneath your skies. Karbala. I feel the darkness of grief within me arise. I feel my heart heavy.
السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله ولا الأرباح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين عليه السلام To start with the greatest name of Almighty Allah, who is the most merciful and most compassionate, whose bounties are unbounded, whose benevolence are everlasting, whose blessings are uncountable, whose being is eternal, whose mercy is unlimited, whose provisions are unending and whose love is our life and whose worship is our faith. My name is Sadiq Hussain Izada and I'm your MC for tonight's program. Brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Tonight, as the first majlis for our Muharram 2023 and inshallah we will have majlis every night till the night of 11th. I would like to share some housekeeping rules with all of you. Inshallah we all follow these rules. The lectures are downstairs. Brothers on the right and sisters on the left. We encourage sisters to come downstairs only if they have reasons. Please keep children close to you and quiet. Child minding is available. Our program starts after the Maghrib prayers. Please, brothers and sisters, park legally. Don't park on the grass. Don't park on others' drivers. Don't double park. And for any nurse or responses, please contact our brothers here. Salala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. To start our tonight's program, I would like to call our brother Qari Rashid Maradi to the stage to enlighten us with the verses of. Holy Quran. Till his arrival, please recite Salala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oh 
Oh uh-huh. 
we need to preach Islam and we need to preach the teachings of Ahlulayn by acting on the words. Tonight, we're lucky. We have our sister Julie here among us who has been serving the community for the past 20 years through her preachings and by helping the brothers and sisters and most importantly the sisters with the knowledge of the jurisprudence of Islam and the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt and has helped many and many of our sisters with their queries and regards to the fear. So I will not take much of your time and I would like to invite our sister Julie on stage to enlighten us with her wisdom and knowledge. Till her arrival on the stage, please recite three loud salawat. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful. In the name of Allah, the Master of our life plans. The one who instilled in us an attraction towards role models and therefore served us with some of the greatest role models throughout time. Some that inspired us for days, some for weeks, some even months, and others that continue to inspire throughout the centuries. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Wa ala arwah allati hallat bi finaik. Alaykum minni salamu allahi abadam. Ma baqitu wa baqiya al-layl wa al-nahar. Wa la ja'alahu allahu aafir al-ahd minni li ziyaratikum. السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين صلوات May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's everlasting peace and blessings rest upon Imam Hussein alayhi salam, his family, his companions, those martyred in his cause, as well as the hearts of millions that continue to keep his name and his message on. Respected guests, on that note, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It truly is an honor for me to be standing amongst you all today. And as a small disclaimer, I wish to say I don't stand here as a scholar, but rather a sister in faith. And inshallah, trying to deliver practical steps to help us live out our most beautiful deen, inshallah, in the best way possible. One of the most beautiful aspects of the religion of Islam is the remarkable opportunities we get year in and year out to self-reflect. We are currently in an era of raising self-awareness. We're in an era of reflection, of mindfulness, in an era of positive mental attitudes, and it's something we're able to see right through from a school curriculum to what we're usually faced with uh, through social media. When we have moments for reflection, it offers us an opportunity to search for purpose and to search for meaning in our lives. Sometimes we don't actually realize that we're living without a purpose until we're struck with a calamity that forces us to reconsider everything that we thought was okay up until that point. Muharram is one of these opportunities. It's an opportunity for a wake-up call. In the journey of practical Arfan, the very first step of spiritual purification is what is known as al yaqdi which means to wake up. Every single human being at some point in their life will have a moment of awakening. 
But what we choose to do with that moment is what will make the difference between a successful life and a life of failure. That awakening moment could be someone's death. It could be a sickness. That awakening moment could be a reality check. Maybe you thought someone was very loyal and you realised their loyalty was no longer sincere. At some point or another, it could be witnessing a marvellous reality, witnessing the birth of a baby. But at some point or other, we will be given an opportunity to wake up. Imam Ali alayhi salam has a very famous quote where he says that mankind are asleep. When they die, that's when they wake up. And our job as mu'mineen is to try to wake up before we're forced to wake up. So when you look at the journey of practical arifan, the very first step is to wake up. And the other thing. So sometimes we may need to find a key to allow this feeling of awakening to last a little bit longer. Thank you very much, Sarah. In our lives, particularly in Muharram, and we are very much honoured for this through the love of Ahlul Bayt we are given this opportunity and we do tend to wake up. And I've seen it, I've seen the flow. Mashallah, our brothers and sisters get very religious. You know, so many of the brothers and sisters, they might change the way they dress, change the way they speak, they, you know, stop listening to music, try to maintain their focus on Rabbul Alameen. But within a month, if they're lucky, two months, it all just fizzles away. So we want to try to find that key that allows that awakening to last even longer. Now there is no doubt that we are living in a time of confusion. There are many people that are very confused and there are many people that are confused about the direction humanity is going in. There are parents that are panicking and many of them, rightly so, there are warranted fears, but it doesn't require such panic. Inshallah, this will be something we'll talk about. The problem is though, sometimes we tend to believe we're the only people that have ever faced times of confusion. And every era that came before us probably highlighted the same thing. This is Akhir al-Zaman, no one's ever been tested like us. It was much easier when our parents were young and our parents probably said it was much easier when their parents were young and our children will say it's probably much easier when our parents were young. But the reality is, this very month, the month of Muharram, it commemorates a time of great historical confusion. It had only been about 50 years after the Holy Prophet ﷺ had left this world, and the Muslim nation was in despair. And we should never underestimate the power of leadership. There was a vacuum of leadership at this very point. And the Shia faith really highlights divine leadership. And this is something that distinguishes us from other Muslim sects. And it's something we should really hold our heads with pride high. That leadership in Islam, first and foremost, must be divinely appointed. It does not matter how great you might see me as, or how great I might see you as. I can only see what's outwardly and evident. I cannot see what's inside you. When Rabbul Alameen appoints a leader, it's because he knows them inside out. And when people get their hands on power, it can really change them. If you've ever looked up the letter that Imam Ali alayhi salam wrote to Malik al-Ashtar, he, he didn't even get there, but in his appointment to be the governor of Egypt, it really will make the hairs on the back of your neck stand if you're in any position of leadership. And if you're a parent, you're in a position of leadership. If you're a teacher, you're in a position of leadership. If you're a CEO or a boss, you're in a position of leadership. But when it comes to leading through religion, it's a completely different ballgame. Because the one thing, and I've been working at Islamic schools for the past 10 years, and working with the community in Islam for even longer. The students that walk in the doors, that have akhlaq, that have the mannerisms of Islam, that absorb the religion like a sponge, it's not because of us. We might be there to facilitate a lesson, but it's what's brewing at home. Because whether we like it or not, we are the absolute role models for our children when it comes to Islam. There is no shortcut in that. So leadership is absolutely vital. The schools of Ahlul Bayt have taught us that we must master ourselves before we try to master somebody else. 
Before I try to be a master over somebody else, I must master my nafs. So if you're looking at it from a way of Ahlul Bayt or the school of Ahlul Bayt, when someone walks into the boss's office, he should offer them his chair. Why? In the Western world, you look really, really silly. But in the world of Adfan, in the world of trying to elevate your spirituality and recognizing it's actually, it's not you. This is a benevolence given to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That seat doesn't mean anything to you. So you offer it to those that are working below you. Many people at the time of this era, when there was this vacuum of leadership, and there was great confusion. We're only 50 years away from the Holy Prophet وسلم, They also would have been confused. And some of them also would have started questioning, like we're questioning today. What's the point of this? And what's the point of that? And does this really make a big difference? Who cares if Hussein is in charge or if Yazid is in charge? There would have been people like that. There would have been people that would have shut down the whole conversation. Very much like what's happening today. There's a nice idea in our minds that if I was to go back then, I would have been this. My friends, we're looking at the story in hindsight. Everything makes a lot more sense when you look back. Everything is a lot easier to fix and solve when we look back. But when you're in the midst of it, I'm very sure our children 50 years from now look back and say, why didn't you guys do something about this? But when you're in the midst of it, it takes a certain level of human beings to be able to see what is right. Some people today might even question, what's the point of commemorating these events? 1,400 years ago, it's finished. Something happened in history, he was a great man, there was a lot of great men that became Shaheeds. Let's close the book and let's move on. Why is it important? Because history tends to repeat itself. Our opportunity as those that came after the event of Karbala is to take a lesson from this great university so the smoke on the screen doesn't blur our vision in our era. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajeem, qad khalat min qablikum sunan, sunan, fasiru fil ardi, fanduru kayfa kana aqibatul mukadhibin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there's been plenty of examples out there before you. So go and travel the world, go and travel the lands, and look at the ending of those who were rejectors. The ones that rejected the truth, even if they knew it. Go and see what happened to them. Maybe they built palaces. Maybe all roads led to Rome. But where are they now? Indeed, life at times can get confusing. And we may even lose our way. But this does not happen to everyone. Not everyone gets confused. Not everyone loses their way. Not everyone gives in to the trends of society. Not everyone needed to travel the lands to see the ending of those before and realize what the purpose and the reality of this world was. Some experience life through a phenomenon in Islam we call al-basira, which means a very deep sense of insight. Our visual lens, our ability to see physically, we call that basar in Arabic. But basira is a much deeper rooted insight, which means some other traditions, and you may have heard of this before, also believe in this deep insight, and they call it the third eye. And some will even encourage you to go to certain temples or go to places to get this third eye awakened. But let me tell you something and make it very clear. There are no shortcuts in Islam. If you want purification of the nafs, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qad aflaha man You are so successful if you can purify it. You have to put the hard downs in. There's no magic pill to gain spirituality. It's a process of continuous observation over yourself and self-purification. If we want it, we strive for it. In the incredible event of Hajj, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the opportunity to visit Allah's holy house, you will notice two things. Hajj cannot be completed without these two things. First and foremost, as soon as you think Hajj, you probably think the Holy Kaaba. The Holy Kaaba is the constant reminder that my whole life should revolve around Rabbul Alameen. My whole life. And what's very interesting in Hajj, you are not meant to look at the Kaaba. 
So in other words, it's kind of like my whole life is serving him, but it doesn't mean I have to be sitting at the mosque just doing salah and dua all day. It's in everything you do. It's how you treat the lady that's serving you at Woolworths. It's how you speak to the person dropping you off. It's how you approach the, the young man you know, that might need a hand on the side of the road. It's how you speak to your children. It's how you speak to your parents. All of this is the way that we serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that circumambulation around the Holy Kaaba, that's our Tawheed. That's my belief. That's what I will never let go. But it won't finish before you go and do Sari. And Sari is your walk between Safa and Marwa. Why do I physically need to go and walk between two mountains and imitate one of the most noble women that never gave up hope? Yes, it's because it reminds us that life needs to have hope and fear, a balance of hope and fear all the time. But what's more is this term of sari, this term of hard work, means you need to have action. It doesn't work with just belief alone. Man amana billah wa anila amalan salih. You have to believe and it gets coupled over with, with action as well. So Basira is something that was endowed to the Holy Prophets and to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt When we see confusion, overwhelm, disarray, depression, loss of hope, someone sees her brother's message being sent far and wide into the generations to come. Salamullahi alayki ya Zainab. Salamu Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. When people saw Imam Hussein's imminent death and questioned his very decision to go towards Kufa, Imam Hussein saw the life of Islam. And in his words, he says, If it's only through my murder that the religion of Islam can stay upright, O swords, come and take me. What does it mean to be alive if Islam is no longer there? During a storm, these people stay calm. In times of confusion, they are very firm. Over the course of the next 10 nights, we're going to be hearing about stories once again of people who survived through the ages, even though physically they are no longer with us. It's the same story. You've all heard it probably from when you were children. Year in and year out, but yet again, here we all are. At this very moment, the world is filled with majalis of Abu Abdullah ibn Hussein. And to be quite honest with you, it doesn't actually matter who the speaker is. It doesn't matter how eloquent they are. The reality is, we don't gather because of the speaker. We gather because of who they were. We gather because we are trying so hard to keep ourselves alive by listening to their memory. And after so many centuries, the very thought that these impeccable human beings are still so vividly remembered that we shed tears for them probably more than we would on the anniversary of a dear loved one. That in itself is a miracle. So what is it that brings us back year in and year out? Is it a possibility that we desire to become like these Ahlul Basira? That maybe we desire to become people of insight? That when the world is crumbling around you, you're able to stand there and say, Ma ra'aytu illa jameela. And wallahi, they weren't words taken lightly. That wasn't just to make the enemy look bad. This is truly who she was. This is truly what she saw. This is truly how she felt. And this is on another level. How can we see clearly and be guided by that which these people were guided. This should be our question. Well, to start, let us figure out what it is that influenced these people most. And if you look back in history, it's actually quite evident. There were two things that led these people's influences. Number one, today we have taken Imam Hussein as an idol without understanding why he rose. It's just a nice story. It's like a villain and there's this hero and we take him and we hold him up high. Some of us even get his name tattooed on our body. And we hold, you know, the swords around our neck and plaster it around our house. But why did he rise? What was his purpose? Because I can't change if I don't get that point. He did not rise to be a hero. He did not rise for us to all be sitting here 1,400 years later crying over him. That's not the purpose of these great men of God. But he rose to keep the religion of his grandfather alive. Full stop. 
Everything he sacrificed and everything we cry over was done for the message of his grandfather to stay alive. And that's it. The two things these great people were influenced by was the Holy Quran and Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Now we too have these great precious things. The Holy Prophet said so himself. The two mighty precious things. Kitab Allah wa And look at how he introduced it. We usually call it Quran. The Holy Quran, the word Quran, Kara'a Yakra'u, means the red. Something that's constantly red. Not the colour red, red over. The Holy Prophet says, I'm leaving with you Kitab Allah. And sometimes we forget that. We forget that this book is the book of Rabb al -Alamin. This is my guide. So we pull it out when someone's getting married and we pull it out when someone's dying and we pull it out when we need a stikara and we pull it out when we're traveling so we don't die along the way. And that's it. And the rest, make sure it's nice and it's got pearls on the front and you give it to your arus when you're getting married and put it in your house and that's it. But what connection do I have? What guidance am I able to draw out from this holy book? A reality we seem to have forgotten is that this book, it is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why are we so detached? And why does it seem so foreign to us? And I'm not talking about it from a language perspective. Arabic is probably most of our second languages, but it's even more foreign than what a language can serve. Isn't it meant to be a guide? And if it is, isn't a guide's purpose supposed to be so you don't get lost along the way? A guide, a handy, it directs you, right? It stands in front of you and it shows you the way. When things get confusing and you have a tour guide, it's no problem, they've been there before, they've done it, they can show you the way. So this guide, this sense of guidance, why can't I benefit from that? Most definitely the Holy Quran is a guide, but for who? And every question you'll post to the Quran, the Quran will give you an answer. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Right at the beginning of the Qur'an We read the seven oft-repeated verses Surah Al-Fatiha And when I'm able to read them with a level of understanding By God your prayer will mean something completely different Directly after Surah Al-Fatiha A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Alif, lam, mim We all know it off by heart Thalika al-kitabu la rayba fi hudan lil muttaqin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words. This is a book of guidance. It's got no doubt in it. Absolutely no doubt. And it's a guidance for who? Hudan lil muttaqin. It is guidance for those who have taqwa. What is a muttaqin? Someone that has taqwa. What is taqwa? If you go and look it up in the dictionary, you'll find 15 different meanings. And that's the beauty of Arabic. It's so encompassing. Nothing can do justice to it. Some have called it God-fearing. Some have called it being afraid of God. God-consciousness, mindfulness. To sum it up, it's being constantly aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your duty towards Him and your expectations. Some of our great scholars, when they narrate their lives, say even when they slept, they wouldn't stretch their legs out all the way because they know Rabbi Alameen is watching them. I'm not telling us to get to that level. But at least to a level, if I'm tossing and turning and Adhan has already gone off, I'm able to get up and say, maybe that's a sign from God for me to recite my Fajr prayer. So our mission over the next 10 nights is to discover what it is to be a Muttaqi and how is it that we get there. To do so, we're going to reflect on a sermon of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in Najjah al-Balaga. And it's a sermon actually describing the Muttaqeen. It's a famous sermon and it was given to one of his great companions called Hammam, where he asked him, please describe to me what is a Muttaqeen. Give me a very detailed description. Talk to me about how they live, how do they think, how do they pray. Give me details about how they deal with other men. And when the when Haman asked him, I want you to describe this at length. Imam Ali salam, knew this was a very gentle guy. And subhanAllah, the wisdom of our Imams, they would answer people according to their ability. So sometimes you might read the same question posed to the Imam at two different times by two different people, he answers them differently. They never contradict each other. But it's like if you're talking to a seven-year-old and then you're talking to a 17-year-old. You're not going to answer in the same way. 
When students usually say, oh, where's God? How come I can't see God? I can't answer a seven-year-old in the way I can answer a 17-year-old. Now, our level of understanding on a spiritual level also differentiates, and the imam could see that, and he would answer us depending on what level we were. So, Amir al-Mu'mineen responds, and he says, Hammam, fear God and do good. And remember that God is always a companion of pious people, so do good, full stop. And he looked at him and said, and it's actually a beautiful sentence, that might be one of the branded t-shirts. Fear God and do good. And remember that God is always a companion. As Allah says to Prophet Musa, Where are you God? Are you near or are you far? He says, I'm right next to the person who remembers me. When Allah says in the Holy Quran, I'm closer to you than your jugular vein. I'm right there. You call on me, I'm right there. But Hammam was not satisfied. And he knows he's talking to the gate of knowledge here. There has to be more. So he says, give me more. So he pressed so much and so did the people around him that the Imam goes on to deliver an extensive sermon that describes this, this muttaki in every sense of the word. Inshallah, over the next few nights, I'm going to try to break down this sermon into smaller snippets. And I ask you truly and dearly, please don't compare yourself to anyone. If I say something and you start thinking of other people, oh wow, she definitely doesn't have taqwa and he's definitely off the rails, honestly, you've allowed shaitan to come in and ruin it. Every time someone else comes to your mind, a'udhu billahi min shaitan ar-rajim and point the focal point back to yourself. All we want to do over the next 10 nights is figure out how far away am I compared to Imam Hussain and what do I need to do to get there? And inshallah, over the next 10 nights, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the tawfiq to have that sense of awakening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us one of those who strive towards having taqwa and are given opportunities on a daily basis to reflect and renew, to develop and to grow. And be it through advice of others or insights or the gift of basira. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Julie Hajjajuli Karaki, for the wise words, for her well being and the well being of her family. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Al-Husaynu minni wa ana min al-Husayn Husayn is from me and I am from Husayn This sentence was said so the Ummah the followers of Prophet peace be upon him do not forget the significance and importance and the position of Imam Hussein salam for us because the Prophet peace be upon him knew that one day people might forget the path and this sentence might help them Hazrat Abdullah Hussein says people with good deeds are not scared of the consequences after the death so may Allah grant us the tawfiq and opportunity to always have good deeds so in the yawm al-akhirah we are not scared of the consequences. And now to reach us more with his knowledge I would like to call upon this stage our brother Wissam al-Rahim al-Ramihi Till his arrival on the stage, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.
connected. Respected elders, my dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before I begin tonight, I just want to acknowledge that you may feel like there's a bit of an information overload or that you may be tired and the program might go on for quite some time. However, I want you to think about this. When Imam al-Sadiq was asked about these majalis, the remembrance of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, he says, Inni ahubbuha, he says, I love these majalis. Ihyu amrana rahmallahu man ahya amrana. He says, Remember us. May Allah's mercy be on those who remember us. And then he says, Those who attend these majalis, their hearts will not die on the day where all the hearts will die. And also, I want you to think about how many loved ones, how many brothers, sisters, mothers or fathers, grandparents who are no longer with us today, who have departed this life before Muharram came, and they wish to be here attending these majalis of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا ابن رسول الله ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ إليكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما. To hasten the reappearance of our awaited Imam, Imam Al Hujjat Al Muntadar, raise your voices in a loud salawat. Subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, wal-ladheena hajaroo fi allahi min ba'di ma zulmu, lanubawwi'annahum fi al-dunya hasana, wa la'ajru al-akhirati akbar, law kanu ya'lamun. Sadaq Allahu al-Ali al-Azim. The Holy Quran is a book that contains guidelines, contains laws for life for each and every one of us. And some may think or some may have the claim or make the claim that this book and these laws of Islam and these laws in the Quran, they no longer apply to us. These laws came down at the time of the Prophet 1400 years ago and therefore they were for that specific time for that specific place and we've moved on from that however that could not be further from the truth because the Quranic laws for life are universal concepts they are universal laws that were relevant at the time that are relevant today and they will continue to be relevant to the end of times and I'll give you one example of a concept in the Quran or a, or a law or a guide in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ And cooperate in righteousness and good and do not cooperate in sin and transgression. Anything you have in life today, any endeavor you want to take, any action you want to do, take it back to that concept. Is there bir in this? Is there righteousness? Is there taqwa? Is there the fear of God? And then you can go ahead and do the action. Or is there sin? Is there ith? Is there adwan? You can't do it. So it's general laws for life that will always be relevant. And the whole Quran itself, as I said, it's a guide for us. So you can think about it as the theory, as the book that contains all these 
laws and guides for us and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and the Ahlul Bayt are the practical embodiment of these laws are the practical embodiment of the Quran when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says to Ali ibn Abi Talib he says to him Ya Ali anta al-kitab al-natiq oh Ali you are the practical version of this book so in order for us to take lessons from this Quran we need to look at the life of the Prophet and the life of Rasulullah and my topic today is regarding migration and brotherhood in Islam and the verse that I started with mentions those who migrate for the sake of Allah on a day like today on the first of Muharram there was a migration for the sake of Allah the caravan of Aba Abdullah al Hussein and his family and his companions on a day like today arrived in Karbala. A migration purely for the sake of Allah to revive the religion of Islam which had distorted so far and gone into the wrong path. And if we look at the times that we are living in today Perhaps some of the most challenging, some of the most difficult times where society is changing constantly, year on year, month on month. Day after day, there's a wave of corruption, a wave of evil after another. And we are living in societies today that chose or decided a very long time ago to disassociate, to, to separate religion from politics and from government and for a long time it was working well because they had these good values and even you know when our parents or when people migrated to this country 20 30 or 40 years ago and they came to a country like Australia or the countries in the West they noticed that there were actually Islamic values in these countries they said, look, it looks like there's Islam without the actual banner of Islam. There were good values, the values such as peace, such as equality, helping out the needy and whatnot. However, the danger is when you split religion, when you say religion is, is for, back, for or back in the day. Religion no longer applies. Religion is not modern. And you take away religion and then whatever you feel like is right at the time, whatever value you think applies, you, you constitute that there's problems that are going to arise which is what we are seeing today because they, they have values they have for example we have laws freedom of speech freedom of religion and now they have the freedom to identify as a helicopter the freedom to identify as whatever you want and these different values these different laws they're going to conflict with each other and so society you'll find is lost and conflicted and they finding it very difficult to deal with this when it comes to the concept of migration of hijrah you'll find that it's mentioned many times in the quran and it is always or mostly mentioned in a very good way in a positive sense and when you look at the concept itself when you are born or when we are born in a country you have a sense of belonging to that place you have a connection a relationship regardless of where the place is because you form these memories these childhood memories these relationships you have these positive memories or situations and you begin to associate that place as home you know for me personally even when i travel for work and i come back and i'm on the m5 and i come in the camel town exit i feel a sense of being at peace, I'm home. And that's natural, every human being will feel that. So, what happens is these home countries become part of our identity. And to leave becomes extremely difficult. In fact, it may be even in some instances impossible. Now, when we look at the concept of migration, when was the first migration in Islam? We have the migration of Rasulullah 
فرق اللهم صل على that migration from Mecca to Medina when Rasulullah with a group of the believers decided to leave Mecca and go to Medina and a lot of questions might arise in that hijrah in that migration why did Rasulullah leave Mecca to go to Medina was it because there was pressure on the believers for them to practice their religion was that the only reason and the answer is no that was one of the reasons maybe it was a, one of the main reasons but it wasn't the only reason because when you look at history today you'll find that the religion of Islam it did spread through migration you'll find if you look at history you'll find that the religion spread in countries that were far far away from where Islam originated so yes migration did help did assist that but the reasoning behind or why Rasulullah left Mecca to Medina was not escape they weren't just fleeing pressure it was a tactical retreat just like in war when you have an army that will still be in a position of power sometimes but decide to retreat for tactical reasons to regroup to reorganize the forces to come up with another plan of attack to how to spread the message of Islam the verse which we began with says وَالَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا فِي اللَّهِ those who migrate for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Because not all migration is for the sake of Allah. Sometimes we migrate to get married. Sometimes people migrate to get a job. We might migrate for a business opportunity. Sometimes people will migrate because of the weather. It's always cold and snowing, for example, and they move to somewhere that's sunny. There, there could be many reasons for migration. However, the, the verse states that وَالَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا فِي اللَّهِ Those who migrate for Allah Because there are a group of people who migrate Solely for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal And even though how difficult it is As we mentioned the connection and whatnot They decide to migrate for the sake of Allah Now, we have to look at this migration when it happens What are the consequences of migration? There are many consequences and the main consequences are the first thing is that a person will lose the sense of oversight. In a sense that, especially back home in, in our home countries, there is a sense of oversight as in when you're walking down the street, when you leave your house, all the neighbors know who you are. You go to the market, everyone in the market knows who you are. Not just who you are, who's your father, who's your grandfather, from what tribe you are. Wherever you go, you are known, you're an person. So there's a sense of oversight. What the oversight does is it restricts us from deviating, from committing these sins. And even though it shouldn't be the reason because Allah Azza wa Jal has the greatest oversight over us, Allah can see us at all times. However, it's human nature and we can't escape that human nature. In the human nature, when we know that someone, a person is watching us, we act differently. So a consequence of migration is you lose that oversight. You move to a foreign country, no one knows who you are. You feel like, you know what? You can do as you please. The other consequence is that we lose a sense of, or we lose the connection to our home country. That attachment and relationship is lost. And I remember seeing a video a couple of days ago where it was a TV program in Lebanon and they, they actually connect people with their relatives who they haven't spoken to in a long time. And there was one brother who said, you know, my brother, all I know is that he left Lebanon to Australia for work. And we haven't heard or seen him in 50 years. And, so, and he said, look, my brother had good social relationships with the family. He would always ask. And he left for work, but yet we never heard from him. Only one letter I think they received after 10 years and then there was like a gap of 40 years, nothing. So the TV presenter investigated, came to Australia, found out where the person lived and found out that they had actually spoke to the neighbor, found out he passed away three weeks ago due to coronavirus, due to COVID and he was buried alone. No one there, he stayed at the morgue for a while and then they had to just bury him because no one was there. So what happens is when you disconnect yourself for, far, for the first year, maybe hard, you're away from home. You've migrated. It's very difficult. The second year, the third year, the longer that you keep that gap where you're not maintaining a connection, 
you're not maintaining the attachment and relationship, you lose that sense altogether. And the third consequence of migration may be that financially you're affected. It's a new country, it may be more expensive, life may be a lot more expensive and you don't have enough savings, so there's a financial consequence. So how did Rasulullah address these concerns after the migration to Medina? As the leader of his community, what did he do to address them? The first thing that Rasulullah did was he had Ahdul Mu'akhat, which translates to the Pact of Brotherhood, where he would bring a Muhajir from Mecca and would get another Ansari from Medina and he would make them brothers. It was literally like a pact by name, one by one he would call this Muhajir and this Ansar and he'll be like you are now brothers meaning what you stand with each other you support each other You help each other's needs financially mentally and whatnot And There was the narrations Say that there was 45 from the Ansar and 45 from the Muhajirin and Rasulullah chose a brother for each one of these 45 except one man He didn't choose a brother for him and that man was Ali ibn Abi Talib And Ali ibn Abi Talib comes to Rasulullah and he says, Oh Rasulullah, you've chosen a brother for every one of the Muhajireen except me. Is there something wrong? Is there an issue? And then Rasulullah says in his famous narration, he says, I have postponed you for myself. And he continues on to say that your position from me is like the position of Harun to Musa, except there is no prophet after me. So that's a virtue of Ali ibn Abi Talib that I thought would be worthy to mention. The other thing that Rasulullah did was he maintained the connection with Mecca, their hometown. He would ask about it often. Whoever comes from Mecca, he'll sit him down, tell me about the affairs of Mecca, what's happening. Sometimes he'll begin to cry. So he maintained the connection with their hometown and their home country. When it comes to matters of our migration, our jurists, in terms of Islamic law, the maraja, what do they have to say about migration? They ask a question, they say if a person is unable to practice their religion in a country, even if that country is their home country, even if it's a country where they have their home, their wealth, their family, their friends, yet they cannot practice their religion, what is the Islamic ruling? According to Sayyid Ali Sistani, you have to leave that country. And, 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 and a lot of other maraja have the same opinion. So if you can't practice your religion, you have to leave. Now us, if we were to apply that to us here in Australia, we don't have that. No one is preventing us by law to not practice our religion, to not pray, to not fast, to not wear the hijab. To not have the majalis of Aba Abdullah. So we can go past that first condition. The second condition is, all right, if no one's forcing me to, or preventing me by force from leaving my religion, however, the environment and the general atmosphere out there is so corrupted, is so full of evil that we cannot avoid it. That whenever my son or your son or your daughter open their eyes, they're exposed to it. They're exposed to corruption, to evil. What's the Islamic ruling? The same law applies. We can argue that it's not, the corruption hasn't got to that point where we can't avoid it, where our kids are always exposed to it. Okay, then the third question or the third case is, there's no law preventing me from practicing my religion. The corruption is not, and evil is not so widespread and it's not unavoidable to that extent. However, the parents themselves, as the leaders of that household, feel like they are unable to maintain the religion of their children. They are not certain that they can make sure that their children remain on the original religion of Islam. The same ruling applies. You cannot stay in that country. So, in summary, the three conditions for a person to stay in a country is that firstly, there's no law preventing you from practicing your religion. 
Secondly, that the environment is not such a vile, corrupt environment where you absolutely cannot avoid all this corruption. And thirdly, as parents or as guardians, you feel like you have the ability to teach your children and make sure that they remain on the path of Islam. Now a lot of us, and I want to be realistic, I don't want to come up here and just give you know, ideas and, and make things seem like they're easy. A lot of us will have legitimate concerns. A lot of us, a lot of people that I'll speak to will say we can't go back home. Whether it's Iraq, whether it's Lebanon, whether it's Afghanistan. It will be a cultural shock. The infrastructure is not there. There's no roads, there's no electricity. There's no safety, there's no health care. And these are all legitimate concerns. We can't dismiss them. They're real concerns, they're real issues. And then when it comes down to it, the two main reasons that you get about why people are not going back or considering going back is two things. The first is my children are at different levels of education. They're different years in school. One's in high school, one's in primary school. Their, their language is not necessarily great, whether it's Arabic or whether it's other languages. And so they can't go back. And the other main reason is, no, my children have grown up and they're teenagers now and I have no control over them. I can't go back. Do I leave, go back on my own and leave my children here? So then, if we have all these concerns, we have all these issues, and it's, we have to point out that this is our country. It's considered our country. It has been good to us in a lot of aspects. We left war-torn countries. It gave us safety. It gave us peace. It gave us a lot of rights. And we feel a connection to it, and that's a natural thing. What can we do, or what are, what are our responsibilities if we make the decision to stay here in order for that to not become something that is disobeying the Islamic law? And the first thing I think we need to focus on and point out and highlight is the first thing that Rasulullah did, is to have a pact of brotherhood. No matter the differences we have, no matter the different ideologies or which marja you follow or disagreements that we have about small minor things or which center you go to or whatever, whatever it may be, we're still united under the banner of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. We're still united by the banner of our religion. And if you were and if you saw or if we witnessed the importance of brotherhood in Islam in general, how many times it's mentioned in the Quran? And how much Islam stresses the importance of brotherhood? Brotherhood does not become important. It becomes absolutely vital when you're a migrant. Because if you're in a Muslim country, then it's okay. At least the general environment is there. But when you're a migrant, and there's a believer here and a believer here, and you're surrounded by disbelievers, by corruption, by evil, then the, the brotherhood becomes absolutely vital. We must be united and set our differences apart. And our maraja don't just give us just laws and rulings and say, yep, you can't, and don't give us any advice. Sayyid Sistani has a book that's actually translated in the English language called A Code of Practice for Muslims Living in the West. And in the short time that I have left, I'll mention some points where the Sayyid states on how you can protect yourself and your children living in such environments in the West. I'll briefly outline them and I encourage each and every one of you to download the book. It's available on the website. And don't read the whole book, just it's at the beginning of the book about how you can protect yourself and your children. And him, I'll mention some of these points. The first point that the Sayyid mentions is reciting Quran daily, especially for the younger generation. We have a narration from Rasulullah that says, Man qara'a al Quran wa huwa shabun mu'min ikhtalata al Quran. بلحمه ودمه وجعله الله عز وجل مع السفرة الكرام البرارة وكان القرآن حجيجا عنه يوم القيامة He says whenever a young person reads and recites the Quran the Quran will become intertwined with his flesh and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place him among the levels of the messengers and the Quran on the day of judgment will be his protector 
extremely important to read the Quran, especially at a young age. Your children will thank you for it. I'm sure we've all been surprised, and I personally have been surprised about how a three-year-old can memorize, you know, this surah from the Quran because they have the capacity. Learning at a young age is very important. So teach your children the small chapters of the Quran at least and maintain that daily. The second point is a commitment to your daily prayers. And I've mentioned this in the past, the Salah, especially for us, living in the West with all the diseases and corruption around us, the Salah, your daily prayer is the medicine that will protect you and cure you from, the, from these diseases. So maintain your prayer at all times. The third point is reciting du'a, whether it's du'a al-iftitah during Ramadan, du'a al-tawassul, du'a kumayl, and other of the supplications that we have, mashallah, we have a wealth of supplications from our Ahlul Bayt. The fourth point, and this is an extremely important point, and mashallah, during the month of Muharram, we see such great attendance. Sayyid Sistani says the fourth point for how you can protect yourself is make sure you frequently visit the Islamic centers and the mosques. Never underestimate the power of building a connection between a child, regardless of their age, and bringing them to a physical location. I've also said this, they may run around, they may talk amongst themselves, but by bringing them here physically, there's a connection. When they're older, when you bring them constantly to the mosque, when they're older, when they're 15, when they're 16, they naturally have a connection to want to come to these places. So it's extremely important that regardless of any differences we may have, make sure you attend the Islamic centers and choose the one that's closest to you. Now we get lazy sometimes. Distance may affect us. We don't want to travel. We don't want to drive. Choose one that's close to you. Make sure you attend regularly. The fifth point is attending Islamic classes. Whenever there's an Islamic class, make sure you attend. Learn something about your religion, about your fiqh, especially for the children. And then the Sayyid mentions, in his book, he mentions listening to cassettes, because back in the day it was all cassettes. Now, mashallah, you have podcasts, you have YouTube, you have all these lectures from all around the world that you can listen to. In English, in Arabic, in whatever language you feel comfortable with, on your drive to work, you have, you know, I used to drive over two hours and I spoke to a performance coach at work and they said, why don't you use that time to listen to some podcasts that may help you. So use that travel time at least to work, back from work, listen to a lecture every day, gain something, gain some, gain some knowledge that can better your life. And then he says, keeping away from places of immortality, which goes back to the second point of why we have to go back when there's corruption around us. You know, when we had COVID, what was the thing? Isolate. Stay at home, stay safe, stay healthy. It's the same thing. If there's corruption around us, then avoid those places. Sacrifice your social interactions for the betterment of your religion and maintaining your religion. You don't have to go everywhere. Wherever your friends are going, wherever people are going, ask yourself, is this a place where myself or my family will be exposed to corruption and make that the deciding factor. The ninth point is to establish friends for the, that bring you closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. An extremely important point. Don't choose the friends that you think, you know, you're going to have the most fun with, that we're going to go out, we're going to do this. Choose the friend who will bring you closer to Allah Azza wa And that friend is a friend that will point out your flaws. That's how you know. Whenever you do something wrong, they'll point it out. That's a true friend. Not someone who just encourages you no matter what you do. And when you form those friendships, those brotherhood, as we said, maintain those relationships. Ask about each other. And it's not just brotherhood, it's also sisterhood. Because Rasulullah also at the same time that he had Ahd al-Mu'akhat for the men, the women of the Ansar and the women of the Muhajirin also became sisters. So it goes to both genders and ask about each other, make sure that you keep that social connection alive because as I said, living in these countries, we, even though you may born, be born here, you have the language, you have everything, 
I speak for myself. Sometimes we feel a lack of belonging. We don't belong. You feel a sense of loneliness. Like, what am I doing here? I don't relate to any of these people that I live around. So the people that you know that are good friends for the sake of Allah, make sure you maintain the connections. The tenth point is to evaluate yourself. Sayyid Sistani says, when you're living in the West, evaluate your actions. Evaluate your day. Evaluate your month, your week. Reflect on your actions. What did I do in this week? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to be happy? Is Aba Abdullah al Hussein going to be proud of these actions? I had a close friend who mentioned something was very moving. He said that my father gave me one piece of advice. He said that when you sleep at night, when you put your head on that pillow, you're about to sleep, think to yourself, if tonight is my last night, and no one knows when that night will be, if tonight is my last night, I'm going to sleep, I'm not going to wake up tomorrow. Did I hurt anyone today? Did I take anyone's right today? Did I backbite today? When you reflect, when you think about your actions, it will ultimately change how you view this world. And the last point which he states is to learn the Arabic language because it's the language of the Quran. I know brothers who are in their 20s now and they're from Arabic backgrounds. Yet they tell me, I wish I can read the Quran. I wish I can open the book and just read anything. They don't know. And sometimes parents, they don't understand the importance of the language. And they think we're in Australia and we don't need the Arabic and you know, it's a modern day, we don't need Arabic. I in fact got my first job because I know how to speak, knew how to speak Arabic. We interviewed, I was still a graduate. And the other person had more experience, yet I got the job because I was working in Fairfield and Liverpool and there was a lot of immigrants and they needed someone who can speak Arabic. So learning the language can benefit you not just for your religion, it can benefit you in general. So inshallah, over the upcoming nights, I'll delve into more topics, delve deeper into how we can protect ourselves, how we can enrich our hearts while living in such corrupted times. Let's 
يا حبيبي يا حسين السلام عليك يا حبيبي يا حسين Raise your voices, don't be shy about it, please. يا حبيبي يا حسين السلام عليك يا حبيبي يا حسين لا دا السلام عليك يا حبيبي يا حسين السلام عليك يا حبيبي يا حسين It's the first night of Muharram It's a month we all await It's the time we are lamenting It's the saddest time today Assalamu alaykum Ya Habibi Ya Hussain Assalamu alaykum You have louder Ya Hussain Assalamu alaykum Ya Habibi يا حسين السلام عليك يا حبيبي يا حسين وي كاني وبزيارتي بدمعي زريج وي كاني وبزيارتي وارثي بدمعي زريج مثل ما اسري صلاتي هالزيارة حضري السلام على جرحك يا حسين كرري السلام على جرحك يا حسين كرري أشهد أنك وترا أنت موت وانصري السلام عليك يا حبيبي يا حسين السلام عليك Peace be upon you, Hussein, and to the Holy Family. Peace be upon you, Hussein, and to the Holy Family. My regards, I send to Zainab, leader of the legacy. Assalamu alaykum, ya Habibi, ya Hussein. يا حبيبي يا حسين السلام عليك يا حبيبي يا حسين السلام عليك يا حبيبي يا حسين أنا حسين you are the right and to me you're a blessing Oh Hussein, you are the right path and to me you're a lesson of the values of the justice you're against the oppression Assalamu alaykum Ya Habibi Ya Hussein Assalamu alaykum Ya Habibi Ya Hussein Oh Hussein, I wish I could go to Oh Hussein, I wish I could go to Ziyarat al-Ba'in On the walk to Karbala where miracles are happy On the walk to Karbala where miracles are happy As-salamu alayk ya Habibi يا حبيبي يا حسين السلام عليك 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 يا حبيبي يا حسين the pain is here the eyes of tears the eyes of tears the pain is here go turn the pain is here the eyes of tears the eyes of tears the pain is here Allah 
the pain is here. Thy thoughts here. Thy thoughts The pain is here. Allah, Muharram started and my heart will begin to express my sadness to Hussein again. Thy thoughts here. Thy soul cheer. The pain is here. The pain is here. Thy soul cheer. Thy soul cheer. The pain is here. Muharram started in my heart to begin to express my sadness to Hussein again. The pain is here. Thy soul cheer. Thy souls I am Muharram all, all the time has come To weep and cry With sadness To shed my teeth To beat my chest To bear the flag Of blackness A holy Family has been traveling all along with pain. A bullfight can be seen protecting Zion. A ball in vain, protecting Zion. A ball in vain. A holy family has been traveling all, all along with pain. A bullfighting can be seen protecting Zion. A wall in vain. A green flag high. A tear high. A green flag high Muharram started in my heart to begin To express my sadness to Hussein Your turn, that is all tea That is all tea Yalla, your turn, the pain is here That is all tea the pain is here. Muharram shouted in my heart to begin to express my sadness to Hussein again. Thy zolti, thy zolti, your voices. Thy zolti, thy zolti. Keep going, girl. I 
حسین سار الله ابا عبد الله حسین سار الله ابا عبد الله حسین عشق خدا حسین عشق خدا حسین روح خدا حسین روح خدا دل زار و پریشون و ببر کرب و بنا دل زار و پریشون و ببر کرب و بنا حسین شاه کرم حسین شاه کرم منم در بدرم منم در بدرم حسین سار الله ابا عبد الله حسین سار الله ابا عبد الله حسین 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 اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم